Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2024 Wilson Dialogue. I'm Martin Parkinson, Chair of the Sir Roland Wilson Foundation. We're joined tonight by Nambri Nunawal custodian, Paul Girua House, who will welcome us to country before we begin. Paul, as always, you honour us with your participation and thank you very much for being with us. Over to you. Mandangu, Wurugu Wuri, thank you, Martin, and Yari Marang, Buru Marambang, Maranya. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you and do uh, Paul Girawa House. My name is Paul Girawa House. Nadu Maradu Marai Biringo, Guji Gango, Nyambri, Cambri, Nuru Nuru Bango. I was born here, uh, the centre of my ancestral country, uh, the old Canberra Hospital. Uh, God bless it. Yinja Matabala Nama, Dr. Matilda Williams House. My respects to my mother. And my respects to all matriarchs here today and this evening. Uh, because of them, we can. Because of her, we can. So, uh, Baladu, uh, Nyambri, Cambri, Wogaloo, Wiradri, Gibia, Nyiyang, Nyambri, Cambri, Wogaloo, Wallabaloa, Nuru, Wiradri, Man, and I speak Wogaloo, Wiradri language. So, Ladies and gentlemen, young men, young women, distinguished guests, Nyari, Njamali, Nyambri, Cambri, Wogaloo, Wallabaloa, Nunawa, Nagariga, Radri, Elders, past and present. Nyari, Njamarabu, Mujigangu, Nurumbanjigu, Ninya Yiridu. My respect to all people from all parts of the country, Nyambri, Cambri, Wogaloo, Wallabaloa, Nunawa, Mayinga, Mbanya, Ninyoga, Nurumbangu, Dara, Nyambri, Cambri, Wogaloo, Wallabaloa, People welcome you all to country. Nadu Wudagibigia, Balabambo Gubu, Balagi Bangubu, Going Gulela, Dumbalina, Murway, Marambo. We listen to the old people, the ancestors, the elders, and they show us the good path, the right path, the straight path. Mara Mara Muru, creating pathways, Muru Waro on track. Going Gulela, Bilingali now, Yama Mali now, Wala Mali now. Our old people, they guide us, they nurture us, they protect us. Looking to see, listening to hear, and learning to understand. We look after country so it is healthy for our children, for all our people, and we teach and we learn what is right for all on country. Living a respectful way of life, cares for country. Respect is taking responsibility for the now, the past, the present, and the future. Our welcome to country is always made in the spirit of peace and harmony and reconciliation for all people of modern Australia. Our main aim always to establish an atmosphere of mutual respect. Through the acknowledgement of our ancestors and the recognition of our rights to declare our special place in the pre and post history of the Canberra region, the name Canberra is derived from the name of our people and country, the Nyambri, Canberra, Canberra. Yinjamara, uh, Yinjamal Gijil, Yinjamara, a powerful word on country, many good things, uh, means many good things. It's a way of life. It's a philosophy, it's a radri word to go slow, be patient, be polite, be gentle, take responsibility, uphold. Respect is in the grinding stones and carved trees made long ago on country. Respect is in how our matriarchs dig for yams in Mother Earth. Uh, we have cared for Mother Earth since the dawn of time and evidence of our occupation, our statehood, our sovereignty can be seen everywhere throughout the country. Our signature is in the land, not just our DNA. Maragala Dal Walamaya Mayangalam, hold fast to each other, empower the people. Walangunmala Mara Mara Gurai, be brave, make change. Diriyamana Murawara Nawan Bira, get up, stand up, and show up. Marambang Malang, Noya Goy Malang, fabulous, wonderful to be here to share. Nay Mura Burumba Bira, Goyambana Nina Nurabanga, this welcome the country. In conclusion, I say, Yinjama Wijo Mara Mara. Respect shapes us, lifts up the people. Respect creates people who care for each other. So, 
Mina Nurabango, welcome to the country. Mandangu, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Um, and uh, I think everybody um, listening to you can't help but be inspired by the, those words. Um, I don't know how many times I've heard you uh, deliver welcome to country, and I always find it uplifting. uplifting. So thank you again very much. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge and celebrate um, the first Australians on whose traditional lands and airways we meet. Uh, I pay my respects to elders past and present, I want to extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us this evening. It's incredibly important to have conversations like the one we're about to have tonight, to engage openly, freely and respectfully with each other about the big issues that affect us all. Because sometimes it's easy to become defeatist when we look around this world we're in. We see increasingly divergent political landscapes. We see that reflected in a rise in populism, authoritarianism, return to nation state conflict in Europe and the terrible events of the Middle East. We see it in the terms of a global community struggling to find common cause on the great challenges confronting humanity, whether that be mass migration to escape conflict and poverty, whether it's global health crises or whether it's climate change. So as the Sorol and Wilson Foundation, we are incredibly honoured to be able to bring you this discussion tonight. For those of you who don't know the foundation, uh, Sorol and Wilson Foundation is a partnership between the Australian Public Service, the Australian National University and Charles Darwin University. Our aim is to build the research and leadership capability of the Australian Public Service and embed connections between policymaking and academia through postgraduate scholarships. We do so in order to honour the legacy of Sir Roland Wilson, an eminent economist and one of the most influential public servants of his generation. Wilson played a central role in steering Australia's economy through some challenging times, including World War II uh, and our post-war recovery and development. And he did this in a number of roles, including as the longest serving ever secretary to the Australian Treasury. I'm certain if Sir Roland was with us today, he'd be most interested in tonight's discussion because many of the issues that are going to be canvassed uh, were things that were important to him uh, as he thought about um, public policy. This year's Wilson Dialogue is going to explore the challenges of the cost of living crisis and the generational wealth gap and to seek opportunities to change. Now, when we talk about the cost of living, we're not talking about a dry set of numbers. What we're really talking about are the economic realities that shape our lives. What we buy, what we eat, and for so many of us, where we can where we can and can't live. We've all noticed the increasing pressure on household budgets over the past few years, but the impact of the crisis has hit some parts of our community much, much harder than others. And we need to talk about that. For many Australians and their families, the cost of living has become a barrier not only to their financial security, but to their social mobility. And in a community where people can't move relatively freely between parts of our um, social hierarchy is one that is destined to face bigger problems. But it's not just about rising prices or falling real wages, or even about the distribution of income even though they're all individually important and I'm sure will be canvassed tonight. Ultimately, it's also a reflection of our poor productivity performance over a long period of time. You know, we've talked about um, our deteriorating productivity performance for at very least since the first Treasury Intergenerational Report in 2002. We've talked about the consequences of that, but it seemed, I think, for so many people to be something that was often off into the future and very abstract. But in actual fact, what we're seeing today is the consequence of this and a number of other forces coming together. Now, why have we not seen the consequences before? Well, basically we've been lucky. As a community, we've seen, we've had a period where other developments have been masking the inevitable erosion of our living standards because of the policies that we haven't actually pursued. And when we move beyond the glitch, catchphrase of the bank of mum and dad, 
generational wealth and its distribution is all about the access to resources, networks, and opportunities that are going to profoundly influence and shape the lives of younger Australians. To address these challenges, we need Australia's brightest, most imaginative and determined policymakers to be on the case. And I think we're very fortunate tonight to be able to have some of Australia's best thinkers join us on an expert panel to um, discuss these issues. So let me introduce them to you. Uh, first up, Daniel Wood. Um, Daniel commenced a five-year term as chair of the Productivity Commission in November last year. Uh, prior to joining the commission, Danielle was CEO of the Grattan Institute, and she knows the issues that we're talking about because she was not only head of its budgets and governments program, but she's had a long history in thinking about um, uh, gender inequality, um, social mobility, and, and other issues. Uh, during her time at Grattan, Danielle held roles as a member of the Australian government's Women's Economic Equality Task Force, the Parliamentary Budget Office Expert and Advisory Committee, Committee, the Jobs and Skills Australia Consultative Forum, and the Australian New Zealand School of Government Research Committee. So welcome, Danielle. We're also lucky to be joined by Dr. Cassandra Goldie. Cassandra is well known to many of you, and she's the CEO of the Australian Council of Social Service and adjunct professor at uh, UNSW. Cassandra also brings a wealth of public policy expertise um, across economic, social, environmental issues, civil society, social justice, and human rights. And importantly, she's represented the interests of people who are disadvantaged and civil society more generally in major national and international project processes, as well as in grassroots communities. She has a PhD from UNSW and a Master of Laws from the University College London. She's a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, serves on the UNSW Law Advisory Committee and the Australian Climate Roundtable, and is a member of the federal government's Economic Inclusion Advisory Committee. Thank you for joining us, Cassandra. Caitlin Figueredo, who's our third panelist, is a proud Goan Australian. And not only that, she's the 2024 ACT Young Australian of the Year. And she assures me she's having a ball in that role. From a young age, Caitlin's been passionate about strengthening representative democracy. At 22, she was listed on the Forbes 30 under 30 list for co-founding the Girls Take Over Parliament program, a bipartisan program that promotes representational democracy and increasing female political participation across the Asia Pacific region. Caitlin represents four and a half million young Australians nationally as a director of the Australian Youth, Youth Affairs Coalition. And through this work, she promotes young people's voices, rights and issues throughout public, through public policy and civic engagement. Again, Caitlin, great to have you with us. And finally, to our moderator for the evening, uh, Rick Morton. Rick is the author of three non-fiction books, including the critically acclaimed bestseller, A Hundred Years of Dirt, which was long listed for the Wakely Book of the Year, a Walkley Book of the Year uh, 2018, and shortlisted for the National Biography Award 2019. And as a plug, if you haven't read it, go out and buy it and do yourself a favour. It's a great read. Rick's a senior reporter with the Saturday Paper, a two-time Walkley Award winner for his coverage of the RoboDebt Royal Commission, and he's currently working on the next book, and he's going to be your facilitator for the evening. Thank you, Rick. I'm sure all of us um, understand how lucky we are to have such an esteemed panel for this discussion. I'm going to invite them to offer their expertise and insights, and I'd encourage all of you as the audience to actively participate in this important conversation, not only tonight, but um, at, beyond uh, this session. So let's all approach this discussion with empathy, with curiosity, and with a commitment to seeking common ground that's going to advance Australia's national interests and the interests of all Australians. On that note, Rick, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank Master, you very much. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's got me excited to talk about some of these issues, actually, and that's not always true. I'm feeling a little bit like an underachiever, I guess, in... <laughs> in the realm of the um, smart people we've got on this panel. So I'm just happy to be here, actually, at this point. Um, I feel like, and you touched on this, Martin, but when we talk about cost of living, 
it becomes easy to see it as a bit of a slogan these days of, you know, oh, we're all worried about the cosy live, um, you know, the price of fruit and veg is up, of course. But what does it actually mean um, to regular people who are just trying to get through, you know, their jobs, uh, through their family um, ups and downs, uh, and to live their lives, essentially? And I want to kind of start the session by defining the problem. What is it that we're actually talking about? Because it's not just about prices. Um, and then I want to move into some of those solutions that we might have on the table or at least some broader thinking about these ideas that sometimes gets missed in the wash. And I, I want to encourage the audience to ask questions as we go because um, I'm trying to get out of the way um, and be the kind of moderator who actually gets to these questions. That means I'm going to be a hard taskmaster as well and try and keep the conversation a little bit lively. But if you're watching at home, you'll notice that the chat function um, is disabled, but we you can submit your questions using the Q&A function. I think it's at the bottom of your screen. I can't actually see it, but um, I'll have those questions um, displayed for me later on in the program and we can actually get into the conversation there. Um, Caitlin, I don't want to single you out particularly, but um, and I don't want to make this um, to be a controversial claim, but I think you're the youngest person on the panel. Um, and I, we're particularly interested <laughs> in the intergenerational aspect of the cost of living crisis. Um, what does the problem look like to you at this point in time? Yeah, so I think when you're looking at it from an intergenerational perspective, when it comes to the cost of living, you're talking about intergenerational fairness and in intergenerational justice. So essentially what that means is that members of the next generation, so millennials, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, and those still to come, have the same chances to fulfil their needs their dreams, their hopes and aspirations as the current generations and those who have come previously. But preferably when you're looking at our system, that they will have a better chance to continue to build and grow their lives without having um, increased stresses on themselves. And when it comes to the cost of living crisis, we're not seeing intergenerational fairness or justice. We, what we're seeing is a generation of young people who are actually scared, a generation of young people who feel like there is no real hope, that there is no real solutions, that the government of the day is actually not listening to them because we have over 76% of young people don't believe they will ever be able to afford a house. We're having increased chances of young people who are going from bed to bed trying to, um, you know, trying to find housing for affordability because they can't afford rent. They're trying to decide whether or not they're going to have children because they can't actually afford to sustain their own lives. And so because the living crisis is not just about, yes, it's about affording food. Yes, it's about affording houses, but it's also looking at mental health and well-being. It's looking at the, the, the um, standard of your life and that's something that has really been impacted because of the crisis. It's one of those interesting things because it's like, what does it mean to have a hungry belly? You know, what does it mean for your study if you're a university student? What does it mean if you're um, close to retirement and you're skipping food, right? And I know, Cassandra, you made the point um, in your own public life that there is the wealth gap within age brackets as well. And so, you know, there are structural issues for young people, yes, um, but also increasingly uh, those structural issues that have always been there for different age groups are becoming really pressing, I think, for people as they approach retirement in particular. Um, what's your kind of assessment of the situation we're in now for people who really are um, in any age bracket doing it the toughest? Thanks, Rick. And can I just acknowledge I'm on the and the Wurundjeri people of Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past and present and um to also congratulate you, Caitlin, on the um recognition of your important role and how important it is to have voices such as yours in the debate. Because I think what's so confronting at this time is to recognise that Australia actually is capable of meeting everybody's needs. We're a very wealthy country overall. We're actually one of the wealthiest countries in the globe um, on measures. And yet um, over the last couple of decades in particular, we've allowed a number of structural changes to happen on our watch 
which have meant that when we go into crises, bushfires, pandemics, wars, where we do have a dramatic acceleration of costs in a particular part of the community. Yeah, I'll, we'll come back to you. I'll, I want to. Okay. Okay. I'll bring Danielle in at this point as well. Danielle, your research has kind of you've been. I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that you've been looking at um, housing, um, which everyone wants to talk about, and and rents, and just I, I guess as the chair of the Productivity Commission now, when we talk about growing the pie and prosperity, and I saw Chris Richardson out today as well talking about the same issue that they're linked, that you can grow prosperity, grow productivity, um, and bring people along with you. But what does it actually look like? To someone like me who's from regional Queensland, I don't know a lot about economics, um, help me understand why that is a good thing. It sounds good on the tin. Well, well, Rick, I would say... um why don't you think about the world that we might have lived in um, at the time of Federation? Um, living standards, so in terms of kind of the amount um, of income per person was about one-seventh of what it was today. Um, so we had a lot less stuff. Um, but on top of that, we didn't have a social safety net. Um, our life expectancy was dramatically shorter. We had a longer working week. Um, we didn't have um, indoor plumbing and all the kind of marvels that, that we now take for granted. Um, and ultimately, it's actually productivity that kind of drives that improvement in living standards over time. Um, so in, sorry, I'll, I'll divert into economist speak just very briefly. Um, productivity I, is really um, how much we can produce, um, labour productivity is how much we can produce for a given hour of work. Um, so as technology changes, as our economy becomes more dynamic, as we learn more, um, we can produce more over time. And that's what has driven that extraordinary trajectory in living standards since Federation. Um, the pace of productivity growth over time will determine that future trajectory, um, how much quicker our living standards can get, um, how much we can, um, you know, support people in the sort of circumstances that both Cass and Caitlin were talking about. Um, so that's why, you know, productivity is such an important part of, of this story. And if I can get, you know, young people excited about productivity and why it matters, then I feel like I've, I've done my job here tonight. Uh, you can use me as your test case because I, I, I'm excited by the rhetoric, but I, I really do, I, I don't quite get the leap. And maybe this is just because of my undergraduate assessment of it. But, you know, why, why do we have to do more stuff? Um, in order to get that better? I mean, what's the nexus between doing more and having more? Is it just because that's the system we've got? There isn't another one? Or um, I don't want to get too philosophical, but I'm curious. Um, because ultimately it is the production of goods and services that, that drives living standards. Um, so, you know, and that is services. That includes health services, education services. You know, that is what you know, as a package drives our, our well-being. So how well and how effectively we produce all that stuff matters for how much of it we can have. And and Cass, just to bring you back in there, I mean, we talk about growing the pie, but of course there is always a link with whatever the size of that um, bubble is, the, the gap between the least and the most. Um, we have to, I think Martin referred to that, if, there, if that gets too big, you've got a society that is on its knees. That's right, Rick. I mean, we've at this time now, and um, despite the level of overall wealth, we've got over three million people who are living in poverty, and that's one in eight adults and one in six children. Um, and that just doesn't happen by default. It happens by policy decisions. And we've still got now one of the lowest unemployment payments in all of the wealthy OECD countries. Um, youth allowance and job seeker um, are woefully inadequate poverty payments. The level of destitution that about one and a half million people who are at any point in time trying to live on that payment is unbearable to think about now. People worry about somebody on the minimum wage and absolutely because we've had a problem with the lack of growth in wages. Let's face it, income really gives you, you know, access to at least the basics. 
Um, and yet job seeker is just 43% now of the minimum wage at just $54 per day. It is, you cannot get your head around what it must be like for a young person who's on even less on youth allowance to be able to live with any kind of dignity, to feed yourself, to keep the lights on, to be able to socialise with friends, to have any level of dignity. And so that sense of hope just goes down the drain. Um, and this is, you know, shared across age groups. Um, but the other part of it, of course, we talk about is the wealth aspect of this. And, um, and on our latest assessment of the wealth distribution, it's extraordinary. The top 20% of people have 90%, 9-0, the time, sorry, the income, the wealth of people in the bottom 20%. So 3.2 million on average for people in the top fifth and $36,000 on average for people in the bottom 20% of our distribution. That's where we're at. And so to Danielle's point about what, what this is, a it's, a it's a circuitous, you know, um, driver of either better living standards and high productivity, which feeds into our sense of well-being, our sense of balance, our capacity to feel safe and secure is related to the extent to which we have at least a fair distribution across the community of people being able to live with enough dignity to be able to feed themselves, to have access to opportunities, to be able to move if they see an opportunity um, and to be able to spend time in networks to actually go out and meet people and to build relationships that might open a door for you to get a job. These are all very basic. Um, that are required for people to be able to have opportunity. Um, and I think the fragility that comes for far too many people now who really don't have any wealth behind them or they don't have much, and we know that getting access to housing is has traditionally in Australia been a big part of that, that also really drives this sense that there are people who have got the wealth behind them and for whom their wealth continues to grow and people who just cannot see how they will ever do that. And we can change this because a lot of a lot of what's driven our housing crisis are actually the policies that um, fueled certain kinds of property investment at the expense of good access to housing for home ownership and a really decent rental market. I, and I, I'm going to bring Danielle in to respond to some of those in a little bit. But, uh, the, I mean, those... The fact that there is a wealth gap in the first place, of course, is is a problem now, um, but it begets a bigger gap over time. If you've got wealth, money makes money. Um, okay. Something I didn't appreciate when I was younger because I'm like, how do you make money with money? You just earn it and then you spend it. Um, but if you've got that backing and that network, of course, um, Caitlin, I want to bring you in here, then you can do more with it. And that's, you know, if you've got, if you're a student at university and you come from a wealthy background or a middle class family who can support you, then you can do more and potentially have more wealth behind you and potentially inherit that as well. And so that gap is kind of like compounding interest in in a sense, because it can get bigger and it can accelerate. Um, I mean, I, I, again, don't want to get too philosophical, but it is a danger with me. But what does that do to the psyche of a young person in particular? Um, who is watching that gap accelerate and watching the time it takes for them, for example, to save up for a home deposit, um, blow out to 9.9 years on average or whatever it is now, and think that even if you run faster, you might not catch it? Yeah, I think it is quite damaging. When you look at the mental, there, there is a mental health crisis at the same time as a, as a cost of living crisis. Now that is, that just shows you the impact that is happening with young people. Like for example, in 2022, like the National Mental Health, uh, Youth Mental Health Foundation surveyed that 57% of young people are having mental health decline in Australia and we're having increased poor and extreme poor mental health skyrocket, including increased suicide rates of young people. That in itself is really scary. So, you know, last year it came out with an analysis of home ownership. To be a single person to own a, to be able to afford a home in Sydney or Canberra, it was estimated you had to be on a salary of three hundred thousand dollars. That to to own a home by yourself that is unreachable for many. I, I would say what, 90 plus percent of Australians. So when you're a young person, you're seeing these, you're trying to even afford basic rent. When you're seeing homes 
dilapidated homes go for millions upon millions of dollars. It was almost like, and I've heard I've heard young people talk about this recently when I, we've facilitated discussions. Young people are continuously saying to us, we were sold a dream. When we were kids, we went to school. Our parents told us, go to school, go to university, make sure you get your degree, make sure you work hard. Once you work hard and you get into the labor market, then you'll be able to afford a house. Then you will be able to spend things, but you just have to work hard. Well, that's actually not the case anymore. You can work as hard as you possibly can and still not have any money or reserves behind you. The average young person in Australia has less than $2,000 in savings. It is quite actually impossible to continue to try and save when we are indexed, when our when going to university, we were told we need to do that, but then we do our repayments through our tax system. But then actually, because of the indexation rate is being the highest in the last decade, all of that money is just paying off that that hex debt that and actually it's going up rather than going down. So, yeah, this is having a huge impact on young people and young people are really cynical. And that's something that we need to start talking about is, well, OK, what is the impact it's having on their lives, but also what's happening the impact on their mental health and well-being? It, I mean, it does feel a little bit rigged sometimes <laughs> watching. And I think um, I, hopefully we've really talked to this, Danielle, watching, you know, when the RBA puts rates up because they're responding to um, an overheated economy. Um, and then, of course, the people who bear the brunt of those rate rises, of course, tend to be mortgage holders, tend to be in their 30s or 40s. They've got kids, they're working. Um, of course, they're lucky to even have a mortgage. Um, you know, they're people who manage to get on that beltway. Uh, but the people who are less affected by that kind of blunt tool are people who already have wealth or who are retired, who have, you know, still taking cruises, I think, was mentioned at one point or going overseas and that was mostly over 55. Um, is there a better way? I mean, because it, it does it does make one cynical, I think, to watch a lot of people suffer, I think, take the medicine um, when they're not necessarily the ones who are causing the problem in the first place. Um, look, I... I do understand and, and sympathise with that view, but I'll just make a couple of points. Um, you know, one is that um, the disease we are trying to cure, which is inflation, um, is very, very bad in itself, and it's particularly bad for vulnerable groups. And I think Caitlin and, and Cass have already summed this up really nicely. But basically, you know, prices are going up for, for everyone, but when you've got less in the way of fat... Um, you know, less in the way of fat in your spending, discretionary spending to cut back on, one, and you've got less in the way of, of savings or assets to draw down on to manage that, um, you know, that means it particularly hurts vulnerable people. So in fighting inflation is imperative. Um, we don't have a great set of tools. Um, so I'm supportive of using the monetary policy tool um, to, to slow the economy and bring inflation down, but it is blunt. Um, and absolutely, I think, you know, and the Reserve Bank have um, recognised that as well. As you say, um, you know, one of the channels it works by is by increasing uh, the cost of servicing loans, who holds the loans, basically young and middle-aged people. Um, it does tend to be kind of middle and high income young and middle-aged people for the reasons that you point out. They managed to get in the housing market in the first place. But um, when we look at the spending data um, you know, we can monitor people's kind of transactions, um, credit card transactions, et cetera. Um, what you're saying is exactly right, Rick. There has been this very sharp age disparity. Um, you know, real spending um, in the kind of post-COVID world has actually gone backwards for 25 to 34-year-olds and quite significantly, um, whereas it has sort of continued to grow for the, the over 55s. Um, so it's, it's not ideal. There are other tools we should complement it with. Um, including various government policies, some of which, um, you know, they they have done, and I'm sure Cass has got views on um, some of the additional supports that, that might be needed. Um, but there's not many nice ways to get rid of inflation is the, the sad truth. Yeah, I guess it's like any medicine. It's not always fun. Um, I don't see people lining up Indeed. for the doctor like it's Disneyland. But um, it does, I mean, Cass, it does, it does hurt, I guess, to have these arguments about you know, who's driving inflation, it's wage spirals or whatever. And then, yeah. of course, um, 
being told that we can't give poor people more money because they are more likely to spend it. Um, you know, the the mere reason they need the extra support is because they need they need the extra money, and that's because they've got bills to pay, right? And um, the Rick and Danielle, I mean, absolutely. Um, you know, um, the people on the lowest incomes who are relying on woefully inadequate income support payments, where um, you know, in our latest survey, about three quarters of people are skipping food um, on a regular basis, and about ninety over ninety percent are in housing stress. It's very serious when prices go up. But the solution is not to keep people on the very lowest income hungry and homeless. That cannot be our response to tackling inflation. Um, we were one of the voices urging the Reserve Bank to not continue to bring rates up because part of that often leads to a risk of higher unemployment, as we know. Um, and, of course, once you lose your job, that is not the solution for you when it comes to facing inflationary prices in on the essentials of life. It's, you know, you, you are hit the worst when you lose your job because you fall onto the unemployment payment. Um, we would certainly um, like to see some of the other levers pulled to make sure that we're getting on top of inflation, um, including some, um, you know, um, proposals associated with the regulation of rents. We should be. We should be properly regulating the private rental market. There are enormous tax breaks associated with housing investment in Australia. It is a housing service that is provided to people to live with dignity um, and we are an outlier in this way in which somehow we see that, you know, if you're a property investor, investor you, it's an essentially an open market for you to put the rent up as much as you like and to leave it to often very disempowered tenants to try and challenge that. That's one example. We certainly think that there should be much better re regulation associated with the pricing of energy in Australia. I mean, you know, to, Daniel, you know what we've seen with energy pricing over the last couple of years in particular and who's paying the price of the overinvestment in poles and wires, for example, um, and, you know, what are we doing to the default market offer to make sure that that is properly balancing the desire for profits in the private market with the fact that energy is an absolute essential service. Um, so, Rick, I mean, I, you know, I don't, there are a bundle of other things that we could also be doing to get on top of inflation. Um, and, of course, ACOS was one of the voices saying, what are we doing delivering another $22 billion in income tax cuts, you know, the original stage three design? giving $9,000 to people on the highest incomes that would be going into their hands. And trust me, it would be spent in different ways. Yeah. Um, um, you know, we've got a redesign of stage three and we're back the redesign of that is much fairer. But the reality is that has been spoken about as a response to cost of living. It is about giving more income into the hands of people. And yet those tax cuts will do absolutely nothing for the bottom one third of people in the Australian community, including the young people that Caitlin is speaking about, who are struggling to get by on barely nothing. And so this is the, when, you know, when the, the community sees this, people who are living, you know, close to the margins know exactly what this looks like. They see who's getting the help and who's not. Um, and they develop this cynicism about institutions because of that. And I think, of course, that's a great risk for us, isn't it? When people lose faith, that actually the people who should be most looked after are at the centre of the debate and the centre of the design of what is done to help people. And so I do just want to really acknowledge all those people on the very lowest incomes, including all the younger people and who has spoken up to share what is often very hard to talk about in a very wealthy country, you know, going without food, how you get by, um, you know, dumpster diving, for example, to look after yourself, sleeping, couch surfing, being in, you know, um, hiding in your car. We've got mums living in their cars all over the country at the moment with their kids, hiding their kids from child protection services. That's where we're at. And and so it is very serious. And so, you know, Danielle, I think this sort of debate is a very important one and we're delighted just, can I say, to see you as chair of the Productivity Commission because I think there is a high road here 
and an exciting road if we choose to take it. We do need to lift up the incomes of the bottom 40% of the Australian community at, as the highest priority because that's actually the engine room of a good economy um, and for all the multiple effects that it, you know, protective effects that, that it has to make sure we're better at place to deal with, you know, shocks and crises um, and then also to ensure that um, we are really seeing our people as our best investment. People on very high incomes are looking after themselves and I think many people on high incomes, they're not wanting more help actually. I think many people have seen just the deep inequalities we had in Australia when we go through the pandemic and what those lockdowns looked like. I think we all got a bit of a wake-up call there to see who was at risk and who wasn't and so... Okay, and I remain hopeful that with more and more voices and these kinds of discussions that we will push the country in the direction that it needs to go and a country that we can be proud of. Here's a question for you, Caitlin, and I'm going to piggyback on what Cass was just saying there because I, th I feel like one thing you could do as a government, for example, if you, didn't, mm. if, you, if you were going to refuse to raise income support payments and other welfare payments, you can pause mutual obligations uh, overnight and this conditionality, this punitive kind of attempt to keep people on this merry-go-round of jumping through administrative hoops, really, that do, as far as I'm concerned, nothing, um, except make everyone else feel good that we've made people earn their income uh, and give it a tick. So I feel like there's this there's the cost of living. Yes, when prices go up, you, you have to shop around. Um, it becomes a tax on your time. Um, conditionality in welfare is a tax on your time. Um, so I feel like there is another poverty here and it's a poverty of the cognitive resources and of the time available to people to live their life. Is that a sense that you get particularly for young people who are having to do gig economy work and run between mm. different jobs um, to make ends meet? Yeah, so we're definitely seeing that. Obviously the dramatic increase in the rise of the gig economy is because due to the cost of living. So we're having young people who are not only, especially if they're trying to go to university, they're working two to three different jobs. We've heard horror stories of um, one young person who lived in the outskirts of Sydney going to university in the city and they're having to take the train over almost an hour sometimes to, to go to, to uni and then in between that they are on their bike trying to deliver food. Then, on, then they're staying up until late past midnight trying to, again, um, either they were being in the service industry and then they get to go home. And by the time they get home, it's 1, 2 a.m. in the morning and they have to have minimum sleep and start the day all over again. So the, and this is where it comes to creating wealth. So you don't have enough time to dedicate yourself to finding good, stable jobs. You don't have young people not having enough time to be able to go to your how like housing inspections. I'm going to give my ex a personal example for myself. M me and my housemate. So we we are renting, and our rent. We've just come at the end of our our lease. We are quite scared that we're going to be kicked out because the owner has been trying to sell the property for over a year. The property, a lot of it, is quite damaged. And so when we're trying to find a house, just trying to even show up whilst we're balancing our lives we can't show up to houses and we're competing against 10, 20 families at a time. And that, and when you talk about this being scared, I am very privileged. You know, as we've talked about tonight, I've, I've just been named AC Young Australia. I am so scared about my housing situation that I've had to go to my parents and my housemate has said, what if we end up homeless? Because in Canberra, the, there's only less than 2% rental availability and this is again the nation's capital you're and you're looking elsewhere around Australia this is the everyday reality that young people are facing and the impact that their lack of productivity is having is again impacting their ability to have long-term being building wealth to be able to have supportive friendship and engaging networks to be able to excel in their careers and then to reach out to new opportunities and this is why we're also having a loneliness crisis faced by young people because it's so insular because they're trying to again just barely survive you can't like i mean i, I think 
I saw some research from Monash where it's like students are not socialising as much at university because they can't afford a drink. <laughs> so, and who wants to stay out? I mean, it's nice to go for a walk in a park, but you can't do that all the time. And there is just that critical mass, I guess, of people enjoying their life. We should be able to enjoy our life. Like, it's, it's okay to have nice things. Um, I want to pivot the discussion to a brighter future, if that is indeed possible. And I want to incorporate some of the audience questions. Thank you for sending them in. Um, I am reading them, I promise you. Um, I'm going to start with you, Danielle. There is a particular question here for you and it asks, um, you know, is it possible to increase productivity and ensure workers can capture a larger share of those productivity gains? Is there a way we can do it? Well, sort of like locking in the dimensions, I guess, and making sure that it's not just corporations. What does that look like if we can do it and who in the world is doing it best? Um, so absolutely we can do it. And and to be um, frank, um, you know, that through most of time, um, that's kind of what happens, right? Um, productivity rises, wages move alongside of that. And if you kind of charted the long course of history, um, that's basically how things have moved. Um, the questioner may be referring to the fact there has been some degree of, oh, sorry, I'm going to be techie economist again, um, wage decoupling of in the, over the past decade or so. So wages haven't fully kept pace with productivity over that period. Um, partly that's related to um, the mining sector and some of the dynamics there. That's been a big driver of that gap. Um, there is some remaining gap that we don't fully know how to understand um, and, and we should think about and, and, and try to do so. But um, I can assure the questioner that, um, you know, as productivity grow, wages will, will grow alongside of it. Um, there are broader questions clearly of kind of distribution and support for those outside of the labour market that Cass and, and Caitlin have touched on. Um, they matter a lot. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've heard... Um, very clearly why it matters socially. Um, let me put the case that it also matters economically. Um, if you're not um, allowing people to, to use their skills and talents and to, to, to flourish in the labour market, we're not um, making the best of, um, you know, the incredible human capital that we have in this country. So um, there's also a kind of a broader argument to make sure that the safety net is such that people are actually, you know, able to to show up to work and and to to look for for, for jobs that suit their skills when they are available. There's an interesting question that's just popped up, which I'll flick to you, Cass, because uh, I do think you know even high income individuals, as this question notes, seem to be quote unquote punished when we raise taxes, right? But there's there's the wealth side of things, which often slides through the gatekeeper, where people who with high wealth um, uh, might have low incomes or relatively low incomes and that doesn't really bother them as much as long as their wealth is left untouched. And this questioner asked, you know, as part of the solution, isn't increasing the corporate tax rate an option? Um, you know, how do you, how do you ensure that people who are working long hours and who are paying more tax in that income side of things are left to do their thing, I guess, and then focus it on the big money earners, the big end of town, um, Maybe it's not increasing the corporate tax rate, but actually collecting the tax with fewer loopholes? I don't know, Cass. What do you think? Oh, Rick, isn't it great? Let's talk about tax, shall we? I love tax. Don't you think that's a fine topic? Tax. Very important. I care about it a lot because um, paying tax is a public good. Paying your fair share is actually a great act of love for the country and for communities. Uh, fair, a decent tax system is what means that we can protect people when bad things happen. It means that we can ensure people get the health care that we all are, you know, should should be able to access. And then, of course, all that list goes on. But again, it is important to cut through the rhetoric to understand who Australia is at the moment with our overall tax system. Very wealthy country. And yet we we collect about the ninth lowest when it comes to our overall public revenues amongst all the wealthy OECD countries. And we are also a very low public expenditure country, similar. So we're really in the bottom um, of those wealthy country groups um, when it comes to our revenue base. And that is why 
we struggle to do the things that we should be able to do as a very wealthy country, including transitioning to a clean economy. And Danielle, doesn't that, that is absolutely existential, urgent, you know, goal that we must deliver on to ensure that we transition well into a very hopeful future. Um, so um, it is, um, I think, very important to see that despite the, the rhetoric, it's actually we um, we are also not, you know, um, very high taxing when it comes to overall incomes. In fact, as a percentage of incomes on average, we we tax income about the same or a little bit less than even the United States. Um, there's an awful lot of ways in Australia for you to structure your affairs if you're a wealthy person to reduce your taxable income. Negative gearing, capital gains discount, putting wealth into superannuation funds, um, private trust and discretionary trust, um, very well organised. You can really sizably reduce your taxable income and therefore you're not being exposed to the tax system in the way that you should really should be to contribute fairly to the public good and the critical services that you and your families would rely on. So that's one part of it. And then, of course, the wealth area. Um, again, um, you know, we don't have a broad-based land tax in Australia, and yet we've seen unprecedented growth of wealth in the hands of people who have got a portfolio of properties. What are we doing there, really? I mean, you know, we, we, we do need to secure our tax base, and, of course, land is one of our best, most efficient tax bases, can't really disappear it. That's one thing. <laughs> we know where to find it. Um, and it is a very good, um, you know, uh, asset for having a really efficient, you know, um, tax that it can be structured so that it's fair. A stamp duty is not a great tax, Daniel, as we know. It's really, it's a problematic one. Um, it means it's a barrier, Caitlin, for young people, you know, it upfronts the cost. Um, it slows down mobility because once you've upfronted the cost, the last thing you want to do is move in a year. <laughs> it's yeah. not efficient in that way either. So, so the, I just want to give those as a couple of examples, Rick, of um, you know the the way in which um, yes, we should be taxing wealth more fairly, more um, in order to contribute to a more decent tax base for, to do good things that we should be able to do for the community as a whole. But there are also ways in which the tax policies are driving behaviours that are not useful for productive investment, that are not useful for productivity, that are not useful for growing the great jobs of the future. I mean, why are we still spending a lot of money on um, tax breaks for fossil fuels when we could do better to tax that and reinvest those dollars to um, drive clean jobs and to drive transition for communities into great, you know, op um, job uh, clean clean jobs in communities that are currently very heavily re reliant on fossil fuels. So I just think it, I love to talk about tax, Caitlin. I hope you do too. Um, <laughs> stay with it because it's so important. It's very exciting. I, the first time I discovered tax policy and I went, what? Yeah, Rick, can you really do that? Um, and I think, Rick, we should encourage more and more people to do that um, and to own it across the Australian community and not allow it, Danielle, as you've seen, I'm sure. You know how it's always far too complicated for anybody to understand. They go, no, it's not, actually. <laughs> it's very important. I, that was, that was I, I feel alive. Um, I, I do agree with you about the fossil fuel tax breaks. I mean, it's like giving a new actor grant to Meryl Streep. Like, I think she's doing okay. Um, you, the, the coal companies probably don't need it at this point. Um, I want to be a little bit incendiary, but it's not me. I want everyone to know this. I'm reading a question from the screen, and I don't know who asked it, whether they're old or young, but I want to go to you, Caitlin. Um, the questioner has asked, let's be blunt, broadly speaking, have baby boomers stuffed it up <laughs> like they have stuffed up the environment? Um, I'm going to caveat that because every time this comes up on Twitter and social media, not every baby boomer, of course. Um, we're talking about structural things relevant to a generation. And we know more now, but also things have changed. And I, I don't know whether you get a sense for whether that's gone too far um, and how to unwind that. Look, I could either be politically correct or I could be honest and I'm going to be honest and say that, well, yes, 
because if you look at the majority of our political leaders, if we, and even in now, a lot of them are quite older, a lot of them experienced a, a tax system and a social service system that benefited them. A big example is university. A lot of baby boomer generations received free education. They were also the ones who took away free education. <laughs> and we've, we've seen the impact that yeah. we've seen the impact that that has when, you know, for example, more, majority of jobs now, high income jobs require postgraduate degrees, but young people often can't afford that because they're trapping themselves into lifelong debt. And when they try and receive a house and they try to receive a mortgage, the banks go, well, actually you have a $60,000 debt. We're not going to give you any more lending capacity. I would say that if you look at our democracy, for example, our democracy is focused on short-term policy solutions. We have an election cycle that's every three years, which actually in that case is more than a two-year working system. Then the government focuses on, well, how do we get re-elected? So this is disincentivizing generational policy planning. You know, there is an Indigenous method, uh, Indigenous um, thought, and also it's really popular in Japan, where you look at creating policy and social and social services for seven generations time. What are the decisions that are we making today, here and now? How is that going to affect people in 100 or 150 years? We're not thinking that. The furthest that I've seen in terms of social policy is 50, uh, 2050, 2075 in terms of defense, if we're lucky. So this short-term decision-making has been essentially a construct from previous generations. It has been sustained within public policy. We're not being innovative. We're not being courageous. And it, it is true. When you're looking at how young people today, they're going to be worse off. Young millennials are going to be worse off than previous generations. And we have to start doing something about it. We need to start having this intergenerational dialogue. And that comes to, well, going back to our tax system, well, how can we restore it? How can we make it intergenerationally fair? And that first goes by removing um, negative gearing and capital gains, which predominantly support baby boomers who have all of the property. It, look, it looks at, well, inherited taxes on large incomes that are then shifted down. It's looking at, you know, um, those who have like big businesses, taxing big businesses and redistributing that wealth. So, yeah, I, I think, sorry, that was a really long wind, winded answer, but I would say that yes, baby boomers, it, they, they use the system to continue to build wealth and that was not then shared generationally. And who wouldn't have at the time, right, have taken advantage maybe, of all of those maybe. things? Oh, 100%. And so, and like, again, like, I get why they did it, but then it's we need to start shifting our policy consciousness to more long-term strategic thinking. And it's about taking courage to go, well, okay, yes, we have profited off of this system, but now it is it, it, uh, mor morally we need to then think about those who are coming after us. We need to be thinking about those who do not have as much privilege as we do and ensuring that everyone has a standard of living that we would like for ourselves. So it's about shifting that mentality from an individual sense to more of a collective. As a, as a country, as Cass said, who do we want to be as a nation? Do we want to be a nation of 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 most poverty people who are barely surviving and concentrated wealth for those who are individuals or do we want to be a nation where it is equal and we are thriving and we are happy and we want people to come here because we have a standard of living that promotes that promotes equity and happiness oh my god i can hey, see why you're the can I say one of the, um, you know, often in the stereotyping, age of stereotyping, shameless, shameless that happens around us. You know, it's one of how, you know, the younger generation is not good with money and it's not responsible and, you know, the avocado rubbish. Right? I mean, I, I want us to remember, I do want us to remember that it was the um, government made up of people probably of a certain age bracket um, under the Howard government, for example, Danielle, that introduced the tax breaks associated with the housing market. You know, the boom, in the boom area, 
era when the resources boom, you know, there's bundles of money around. <laughs> instead of investing it, instead of properly putting it into, you know, savings accounts to make sure that we we're ready for the next, trans, you know, transition that we needed, um, it all got blown on in a lot of tax breaks. Superannuation tax concessions went through the roof. They were policies that were implemented during that boom era. Um, and so, you know, it was the politicians of the time who often, in fact, you know, wasted um, and blew the money um, and spent, you know, designed those tax breaks that have now fueled quite damaging social con and economic conditions for us. And so um, I just, you know, think it's really important to also see that there are individuals out there of all age groups who are trying to navigate their way through this, but actually these are laws and policies that have created these conditions and it, it is therefore, I think, a real opportunity for us to be coming together across ages to say, actually, we don't want it like that. We do want to see good policies put on the table um, for us to carry the debate properly um, because I know many, many people who are older, they know exactly the story that you're sharing about the experience of younger people and do want to see the changes that would, would create those conditions for generations coming through. I, I think when we do, and I'm going to throw to you for the longer term um, view, Danielle, um, but certainly one of the, from an individual point of view, I've had discussions with people who are like, oh, yeah, no, I just bought a house in Sydney and they're lovely people. And I'm like, oh, um, and then I'm like, how did you do that? And they mentioned that they saved up some money. And then, of course, they throw in, oh, and mum and dad gave me some money. And it's like that attitude, whether it's a baby boomer or a younger person from um, from a little bit of comfortable of, of a background, it's it, all you really want is someone to say, look, yeah, these things helped us and they are probably no longer fit for purpose. And what we often get in a political sense is that, well, we did it tough because we had, you know, 70% interest rates, which was tough. And I remember having an, uh, an argument with an editor about this who, because of that one fact which was difficult, refused to acknowledge all the other facts that are currently difficult for millennials. And so, Danielle, from a from a looking at the strategic point of view about like how do we how do we take an intergenerational equity focus? How do we take it forward? What are the things we need to be looking at over the long term, whether it's one or seven generations? Um, I don't expect you to have modelled seven generations at all in your career, but um, maybe you should have. <laughs> and what do we need to look for um, to change things and you know, small incremental changes now with big effects down the track. Yeah, I, I love the seven generations. I think Treasury's had a go at 50 years, but uh, it, you may well stretch their uh, models um, to the limit. But, I mean, I think Caitlin um, said it beautifully when she sort of talked about it as, um, you know, can we leave the world as a better place for the generation that, that comes after us? And that's actually all sort of very economics frame, but that's always the, the frame that I've tried to bring when I think about this issue because I think that is a very human um, impulse that, that many people can get on board with. Um, so, look, there, there's a number of pieces to it. Um, you know, we've talked about um, stagnating incomes for, for young people tonight um, and that that has been um, particularly that kind of decade pre-COVID, um, basically 25 to 34-year-olds, um, the, the group at the end of that decade didn't, they actually end less than the group at the start of that decade. That is a big issue. Um, we expect generation on generation progress um, for the reasons I've been talking about tonight. Um, so we need to get the productivity growth that is going to enable young people to have the opportunities that they should have in the labour market and to get jobs that they um, are qualified to do. They shouldn't be sort of um, pushed down the jobs ladder as we saw kind of people increasingly having to take um, jobs at lower levels of education than, than what they were qualified for. So that was one. Um, housing, we've we've spoken a lot about um, the kind of lack of opportunity for young people to get into the market. It is a huge issue. Um, people have touched on the tax settings. I just really want to say supply matters a huge amount as well. Cool. Um, unless we enable more supply close to jobs and amenities, um, not just sticking people on the fringes, we have to build density um, in our own middle, middle, inner and middle ring suburbs. Um, that is also, unfortunately, has a generational dimension to it. Um, you know, if you want to put your neighbourhood in aspect and never have it change, that's very nice. But um, what you are doing is perpetuating um, this, this problem of unaffordable prices and 
the New South Wales Productivity Commissioner came out this week and said, um, you know, Sydney is going to be a city without grandchildren. Um, and, you know, what he means is basically young people are just being driven out for, and, and Caitlin's given you some of the stats um, around affordability. So um, we need to to boost supply. It does mean our cities are going to look different, but that is the only way that, that frankly, we're going to deal with this issue um, over the the long term. Um, we, we haven't sort of talked about... Um, Indigenous policy and, and closing the gap tonight, but there's lots of intersections um, um, around kind of opportunity. Um, we've just put out a report looking at the closing the gap review um, a couple of uh, last week or a week before um, that that showed you know we governments just have not fundamentally changed the way that they are going to need to work um, and you know, listen to work with be guided by communities when they are making. Um, decisions around Indigenous populations, and until we fundamentally change that way of working, um, we are we're going to struggle to to meet the ambitious targets that we have set for ourselves there. Um, so that um, you know that is another you know, really important pivotal long term piece um, for our for our economic and social prosperity. Um, so you know those are kind of the big rocks, I think, from, from my perspective, when I think about, you know, what would really shift the dial? Oh, sorry, and I'm missing climate, which um, you can't really miss when you're talking about um, intergenerational issues. Um, you know, Cass has already touched on this, but we we have to, you know, we are making progress. We have to make faster progress, as does the world, um, because otherwise, actually, you know, seven generations is almost a kind of moot discussion. Um, you know, we, we have to... Um, leave our children and our children's children um, an inhabitable world where they're not um you know dealing with the the worst fallouts of um of, of climate change so um there's a number of really big important pieces there but those are the things that i think about when i think about that generational bargain just i mean human kind of we're not great at forward thinking or passing the marshmallow test uh, <laughs> by waiting for the better thing or doing the hard thing now for the better result in the future. I think it's, you know, the wise man plants the tree, the shade of which he knows he will not sit under. But young people don't really have that option right now. We've we've got to do the work because we're the ones growing up. Well, I'm, I'm barely young anymore. I'm an elder millennial. Um, I should probably stop classifying myself in that, re <laughs> in that group. But, you know, time marches on and, and people who are voting... Uh, for certain policies now, won't be here in 30 years. That's just a fact. Um, so, Caitlin, how do we bring young people into that conversation, and not just in a tokenistic sense, but actually listen and change the political... I mean, I, I, I think the debate when Bill Shorten tried to introduce franking tax credits, um, I remember doing some data stuff, and the electorates that most voted against it were, you know, well-off, um, older electorates. And it's like, all right, I get it you're trying to preserve a certain lifestyle, but we need to change now. So how do we actually listen to young people without this kind of, I guess, this intergenerational fun fight? <laughs> yeah, so I think for a really long time, so just looking at the political landscape, the reason why we're having this deficit sort of discussion when it comes to young people, we're having a lot of social policy issues and this generational gap that young people are now facing is because of political design. It A lot of it was back in 2013 when the Abbott government came into power and all of a sudden they made this unilateral decision to completely decimate the youth sector. All of a sudden overnight there was no more office for youth, there was no more minister for youth, there was no more federal funding for the youth affairs. Um, peak body, AAC, which I've been a part of, um, all the federal funding for the for the sector went away overnight. ACOS was actually the one who was leading the charge of trying to bring it all back. AAC was, we were struggling to survive. I started when I was 20 years old in AAC. We had less than $13,000 left in the bank account. And we were just volunteers going, how can we keep this alive for young people? So for almost a decade, there was, there was nothing. In 2022, um, under after a change of government, after the Albanese government came in, they did re-establish youth government structures. There was a $10.5 million investment into the youth sector. With that, all of the structures that once existed under the under the Gillard, Gillard government was then brought back. 
what they're currently doing now is there are youth advisory groups. There's a ministry advisory group. There's the Office for Youth. AIAC is refunded. However, it is still not enough in terms of engaging with young people who are who are who are face the brunt of the policy issues in rural, remote First Nations communities. They are hardly the ones who have access to these groups. Um, and what I think I'd love to see is there is a there is an organization there's a movement in Japan called the Japan Future Design Movement, and I would love people to to check it out. So basically, it is a participatory design um, movement where it invites community groups. So this is specific for looking at long term city planning and housing planning. They invite community groups to think about well, what what does what do you want your community to look like in twenty sixty in terms of housing, in terms of um, transport systems, uh, in terms of the environment, and for them to design their own ideas. Now, it doesn't have to be rational. It doesn't have to be logical. Rather, it's about bringing in all of those different ideas, bringing in all of those different diverse perspectives, giving it into the hands of the decision makers and policy makers and getting them to then co-design it with the experts. I would love to sort of see a that sort of model be implemented within Australia. I think um, it... Think Forward, for example, is an amazing organization that is trying to change the landscape of promoting intergenerational discussion, making our tax system and talks about our tax system accessible by educating young people, which I think is really important and crucial. It's about supporting, they have a petition right now to have an intergenerational um, inquiry on looking at, well, what are the, hang on, I've got to, I actually do have notes on this because I want to make sure that it is, it is correct. Um, so their system is looking at how do, sorry, give me one second. Uh, okay, I've lost it. All right, go, ch go check out their, go check out their inquiry because it's with government right now. And so essentially it's going to make sure that the government and treasury systems looks at, well, how does our current system affect future generations? What are the current gaps? How can we start engaging and discussing with young people about these future design systems? And I think that's how, by listening to young people rather than just seeing them as the problem is a start by sharing power with young people so that they can design their own solutions is really important and making sure that we make politics accessible, making sure that we have a pipeline for young people from all across the political spectrum, from all different races, ages, groups, ethnicities, that they have a place in politics, in parliament, so that they can start raising their voices from a young age. I'm so sick and tired of politicians being dominated by older generations. We need both. We need young innovation. We need new trains of thought. We need long-term decision makers coupled with those who are experts who have been a part of the system and working together. It's not us versus them. We need to have our parliament reflect the diversity of our communities. And I think by creating pipelines directly into politics, by creating uh, do, do, uh, think tanks, by creating do hubs, all that kind of stuff with young people, that's how we can start shifting the narrative. God, I, you're brilliant. You're brilliant. Um, you're fantastic. I want to um, ask you, Cass, because I think this does, when things erode at the bottom, I think is when you start to run into crises of social and cultural context. And we've got two big changes coming on top of what we've already experienced, which is climate change, of course, and then also another technological revolution, it feels like. Um, I don't know enough about artificial intelligence, but I do know that as someone, I, I saw someone smarter than me tweet that it's not necessarily going to do your job better than you, but a lot, a lot of managers are going to think it will, and therefore a lot of people will lose their jobs anyway. Um, so these big changes are coming. How resilient do you think we are? This is a question from the audience. Um, you know, how resilient are our social, cultural, political and economic systems in the face of these increasingly volatile challenges, particularly they're asking about climate there? When things get tough, there's a bit well, of... Look, it's, um, it, it, it's tough, but um, every time I get in a room of really diverse people who have um, lived the reality of the diversity of the lives that we're currently talking about, um, I come out going, but we can do this. So I, I want to be... Um, with ACOS, for example... Um, 
we have now put very front and centre two core strategic goals. Yes, we want to end poverty and disadvantage, and we can and we should. And something like lifting job seeker and the unemployment payment and youth allowance to the same rate as the pension rate where it used to be, um, so that it's decent and we lift people out of poverty. We could, we can do it overnight. And actually, Rick, we did it overnight we did. during the pandemic, yeah. and it was cruel to for people directly affected to see how easy it was. We often talk. We've talked a lot about hard things. That's not hard. Doing that, we could do it tomorrow with political will, and we should do it tomorrow. Um, and I want to thank all the business people and all the economists and all of the civil society organisations, but particularly people on very low incomes who have worked very hard to keep that at the front and centre of debate. We can fix it. Let's do it. But on this the, this stuff about the dy dynamism of what's happening, to you know, global effects, technology effects, climate movement, um, we have to re reinvigorate democracy. And so our other strategic goal is, is that people directly affected, the most at risk, should be in the front and centre of design. Hmm. It's a democratic, you know, um, a, a urgent case for us, I think. And you saw it, Rick, in the RoboDebt Royal Commission. One of the key findings for the commission there was there were a number of political factors that absolutely allowed that to happen on our watch. Um, devastating you know, tragic, the way that people were brutalised. But one of the key findings of the commissioner was we needed to have people directly affected, people on low incomes all over government <laughs> at every stage to get a better outcome from our social security system. Here, here, more to that. And then the list goes on. In the climate area, um, you know, we are right now, um, advocating to ensure that when the legislation to create the net zero authority comes into parliament and it's soon, it's in the next month, Caitlin, watch out for it, we need to be in there to say that legislation must make sure that we've got people who are most at risk, people on low incomes and young people and people in diverse communities in the room, not consulted, mm -hmm. not an advisory group, in the room sitting alongside the resources industry and the energy companies and, you know, the very power, perceived powerful people so that you are part of the decision-making. Um, for far too long, Rick, I think we've had this notion of sort of it's, it's quite a welfareist thinking in Australia. The powerful people are the very sensible people. They're the older people. We to be ageist, you know, that's the reality of it. Often our decision-makers are a certain look and feel. You know, typically older white and male. Um, and then you've got all these advisory groups that come and go but never actually get access to the real power and decision making. And so I, I, I speak a lot more about that because I can see it, that that's where you get the adaptive thinking going on and everybody benefits. And I know many of the politicians who sit who fit that uh, sort of stereotype profile are absolutely in agreement. Caitlin, so we've just got to make sure the the sort of the, some of this legislation properly reflects that, um, and because otherwise we will have a default position on on this. Um, and may I just um, look? I know we're starting to you know come towards the end, but I do um, I think we we need to also recognise that in the climate and energy transition area, it's not a future risk about people missing out and people on you know more disadvantage being hurt if we don't get it right that is happening now um we've got you know people who have got the access to the best of technologies who are able to produce their own energy who are retrofitted their homes um and who are now actually looking at how they'll make money out of all the industry opportunities of the transition um, and yet people on lower incomes, people, younger younger generations are not, I'm seeing in all the sort of decision-making structures, nor are the, the low interest, um, you know, investment opportunities being presented to retrofit housing in Australia in the same way as we might want to see when it comes to attracting the best of industries into Australia. So it's a, it's a major, major transformation we're talking about here. Um, and I, again, um, ha we have been urging that at all layers, we must have equity and fairness and the diversity of the population represented in the decision-making rooms because um, um, we're very aware of, you know, the finance sector is there, the business community is there, and, you know, great, the union movement is there. That's really important. But we need to make sure that the diversity of communities are there as well because it's um, when you get it wrong, it's pretty devastating. 
Absolutely agree. Um, we are coming towards the end of the evening, so I'll, I'll go into final remarks. But, Danielle, I guess I wanted to um, feel free to take this wherever you want. But given that there is technological change um, increasing in pace, I guess, and that has a productivity effect in its own right but also an unemployment effect, I, I gather, what's the thinking around, uh, you know, how do we prepare for another great technical technological shift? Yeah, it's um, it's such an important question, um, and I think you know, generative AI is kind of um, increasing in at a speed that um, certainly none of us <laughs> anticipated. Um, it, it is exciting from a productivity perspective, and um, it, it's a general purpose technology that can reach into all parts of the the economy um, and potentially transforms a um, whole lot of of sectors. Um, you know, you touched on the job effects. Um, a lot we think will be around um, tasks rather than jobs. Um, so freeing up the kind of mechanical, more easily automated parts of what we do. Um, and then the people can concentrate on the things that, that people do well, um, which is, you know, dealing with others and caring and creativity and those sort of things. Um, I think it is inevitable, though, in any major technological shift that um, some jobs are lost. Um, what I can say is two things. Um, one, certainly past experiences of, of major technological shifts, um, we have seen job creation being greater than job destruction. Um, so, you know, overall, we actually grow jobs in the economy overall because there's all these kind of new roles that we probably can't even think about what they might be yet. Um, what we have to be careful, though, is, is those people that um, do lose work that they're not left behind. Um, and so the capacity to, to retrain, um, to make, well, one, make sure we have a decent social safety net, extremely important. Two, that that we are there with opportunities to retrain in the jobs of the future um, is, is really important. Um, and that it goes to the heart of, um, you know, getting that broader social buy-in for the change. We have seen that with the energy transition as well. There are so many renewable energy jobs and if we'd kept the renewable energy targets, I suspect we would have been among the leaders in the world of some of that stuff. It's, But we're not here to look into the past. Uh, we're here to look at the future. Caitlin, you're the future. Um, we've got a little bit of time left for your final remarks. But you know, what's your positive, what's your source of hope in all of this? Um, yes. You see smart people, I imagine, every day. You're one of them. Um, is that a source of optimism? I think my source of optimism is just the level of buy-in that young people, especially from diverse communities, have for th their willingness to engage, their willingness to want to shape and create a better lifestyle, not only for themselves, but more importantly, their communities and those to come. They're eager to get involved. They're eager to design solutions. And we they want hope and they want courageous action and that's why they are out in numbers we are seeing it through their activism through creating through talking to politicians every day trying or even creating their own programs and organizations and businesses if there is nothing there they create it and that is what is filling me with so much hope it's not only in Australia but we're talking about climate activists from the Pacific literally 12 years old they're going to the United Nations standing in front of the General Assembly saying these are the solutions this is the reality let's find something together and it is that optimism and it's that continual drive that fills me with a lot of hope. Yeah, I like that. And Cass, in 30 to 45 seconds, final thoughts, final bits of hope? Yep. Um, I think we demonstrated um, at different parts of the pandemic that when we really see the writing on the wall, we're capable of extraordinary things and of coming together as a community. It was not perfect, but there was some really powerful measures introduced and supported broadly. Political stakes went up when governments moved to do really big and important things to protect people. And so I think that demonstrates for me that if we can be clear enough about the reason why and the sense of what's at stake if we get it wrong, then we have the, this capacity as an Australian community to back 
the really important leaps that we've got to take. I hope it doesn't take more and more extreme weather events for us to take the great leap about the big investments we need to have a fair, equitable and just transition. But we're capable of doing it. We've demonstrated quite recently um, and that gives me hope. And, you know, of course, um, I see right across the communities that I am very privileged to spend time with, people I meet every day, um, the resilience, the grittiness, the toughness um, is absolutely there, um, you know, uh, and um, and we, we have as a country a lot of resources available to us and that can't be said of some other parts of the world in the same way. And so with my hope comes also that message that we have a responsibility to do this. Um, and that that is the sense of pride that comes. And, you know, off the back of a, the devastating result of The Voice, I think, again, for us picking ourselves up and being very clear that if we, if we get it right for First Nations communities and back in the solidarity, great innovations, you know, happening in First Nations communities around change and adaptation in the face of some of the toughest rejections and, you know, sense of, you know, despair sometimes. Um, then again, it demonstrates that um, you know innovation um, often gets us where we need to be. But but we need to be clear-eyed about the facts of where we're at as well to make that case for change. Headed, not hard-hearted. Um, Dr. Cassandra Goldie, Danielle Wood, Caitlin Figueredo, um, it's been an absolute pleasure to host all of you tonight and um, for the 2024 Wilson Dialogue. And thank you to the Australian National University for having us and to our audience for participating. Um, I do feel hopeful and I do feel like we can do great things. So thank you so much for joining us tonight and um, good luck.